say this is a new book by Dr. Ben Carson. And if you ever have a chance to do any of his reading, I advise everybody to please do so. Um, if you start with his book, Get Good Hands, it's kind of an autobiography of his life. Then he's got a book called America the Beautiful. This one is called One Nation. And it's just been out a few weeks. And I just started on this a few days ago. And he was invited by, not by President Obama, but by the uh, congressman to come to the prayer breakfast and to do a speech. And um, before the speech, he was asked for a copy of his speech. But he said he doesn't have a copy or anything that he goes by. And he was invited for the prayer breakfast, but he was asked not to pray and was asked to follow certain guidelines. But thank God we have someone who loves and trusts in God and in this country enough that he did pray and that he did deliver his speech the way God led him to deliver it. And then after the prayer breakfast, he was actually asked to call and apologize to President Obama, and he refused to do so. And if you'll Google him on the Internet, you will see how the president is trying to come down on him. So um, during the speech, this was part of uh, the speech that he gave that morning. 200 years ago, this nation was involved in a war, the War of 1812. The British, who are now our good friends, thought that they were young whippersnappers. It was a time for us to become a colony again. They were winning that war, marching up the eastern seaboard, destroying city after city, destroyed Washington, D.C., burnt down the White House. The next stop was Baltimore. As they came into the Chesapeake Bay, the Armada ships, the warships as far as the eye could see, it was looking very grim. Fort McHenry is standing right there. General Armstead, who was in charge of Fort McHenry, had a large American flag commissioned to fly in front of the fort. The admiral in charge of the British fleet was offended and said, take the flag down. You have until dust to take the flag down. If you don't take it down, we will reduce you to ashes. There was a young poet on hand by the name of Francis Scott Key, sent by President Madison to try to obtain the release of the American physician who was being held captive. He overheard the British plans. They were not going to let him off the ship, and he moaned. At dusk, he approached, he mourned for his fleeting young nation, and as the sun fell, the bombardment started. Bombs were bursting in the air, missiles and so much debris. He strained, trying to see, was the flag still there? But he couldn't see a thing. All night long, it continued. At the crack of dawn, he ran out to the banister, and he looked, straining with his eyes, but all he could see was dust and debris. And then there was a clearing that he beheld the most beautiful sight he had ever seen. It was a torn and tattered, star and stripe, still waving. And many historians say that this was the turning point in the War of 1812. We went on to win that war and retain our freedom. And if you had gone under the grounds of Fort McHenry that day, you would have seen there at the base of the flag were the bodies, bodies of soldiers who took turns propping up that flag. They would not let the flag go down because they believed in what the flag symbolized. And what did it symbolize? One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes. 
Debbie just to her granddaughter out, but uh, I'll tell you what she said in Sunday school since she's not listening, and nobody won't tell her. But I, she just said, you know, we've got so much talent in this church, we ought to have more people sing. So I guess I could start appointing people. Brother Harry, you can sing next time. <laughs> Me and Shannon take next time. You'd be right. <laughs> Brother Dick, you'll take the next one. Yeah. Uh, that comes from back here. That's it. <laughs> but uh, Amen, we do have a lot of talent. <coughs> Hearts have been blessed. And we are uh, going to look this morning at uh, familiar scripture in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I was going to preach out of Psalms about freedom, then I thought uh, people want to be changed. We need to be changed. And some people I have talked to said, I just don't know how. This morning I want to speak to you in the next few minutes on how to get the most out of your Christian life. How to get the most out of your Christian life. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Let's pray. Father, as we kneel behind this desk, we thank you for what our hearts have already felt and what our ears have heard. We thank you for the talented people that you have given us. Lord, I pray today that you'll take this message and that you will help us all to leave here knowing how to get more out of our Christian lives than we do. Lord, I pray that you will speak to those that might not know you, those that's walking far from you. May they take a fresh hold of that nail scarred hand. We pray again for the prayer request that was mentioned, and Lord, for so many unspoken requests. We ask you now, though, that you bless us as we finish this day, this sermon. May the Spirit of God fill each and every heart and life. May we leave here saying as the psalmist did, it's been good to have been in the house of the Lord. We thank you for it. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. These two verses will tell us so much about how to get the most out of our Christian life. In chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. And the word beseech, if you'll look it up in the original, it means almost, I beg you. I'm pleading with you, he says, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. I love the word living here because most sacrifices are dead. But he wants us, while we're alive, to present ourselves a living sacrifice, acceptable unto God. And did you notice the last few words of verse 1 says, which is your reasonable service. Not asking you to do anything unreasonable. It's our reasonable service to do what God has for us to do. Verse 2, and be not conform to this world. I've said this before, 
some people look at the keeping up with the signs of the times. And boy, you hear this a lot. Boy, you're in style. You know, and then I heard one preacher, I heard Brother Bobby Jackson not too long ago, make the statement if somebody wore a frying pan on their head and come to church at next Sunday, there'd be a whole lot of them wearing frying pans, trying to stay in style. But uh, listen to what he says. Don't be conformed to this world and simply means if I took this water and there was a bowl there and I poured it, it would conform to whatever gravity pulled it to. We're not to be like that. We're to be different from the world. And he says, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. May the Lord add His blessings to the reading of His Word. How can a Christian make his life count? Has been rightly asked by people that's not been Christians for very long. What can you do to make a difference? How many people do you know that when they left the world that people still talk about them? You know, in 1776 we learned Wednesday night that uh, the Declaration of Independence was written and we have learned that uh, Jefferson wrote it in Virginia and not many around him. He was just the best writer and he was a writer. He wrote it and then he took it back to the group that got together to sign it and it was changed. Three or four times it was changed. And one fellow said, well, the fourth is not really the birthday, it should be the second. Because that was when it was written and then went through the changes in a few days. But I'm glad that we have the Declaration of Independence. And I'm glad that it gives us liberty, gives us freedom, but this is also a declaration of independence. And it gives us spiritual freedom. It gives us freedom for eternity. Now how long is eternity? There ain't no end to eternity. Eternity goes on and on and on. And I want us to see four or five things just out of these two verses that will help us get the most out of our life while we're here. To avoid the tragedy of a wasted life. You know, you can ask some people, what about so and so? Well, he was a loner. We don't know anything about him. He was just out by himself and he's dead and buried and soon forgot. But some names that was read already this morning from this pulpit, we know because their life made a difference. And we can remember them for what they done. I don't want to be like one fellow told me a long time ago. He said, you know what a difference a life makes in this world? One life. He said you can put your hand in a five-gallon bucket of water and pull your hand out and the hole that's left in that water is what you'll leave. Ain't nothing left in that water. You know how it does. It just conforms back to where it was. But the Bible gives Christian marching orders. It tells us what we need to do. It tells us what we need to do and 
You don't forget people that help you. You don't forget people that really pray for you when you're the one that needs prayer. You don't forget good people. And I want to mention several things to you. Count the cost of being a disciple of Christ. All believers are children of God, but all believers are not disciples. Let that soak in for just a minute. You find that all believers are not disciples. The uh, term for disciples are given in Matthew chapter 10, and I'm not going to turn there and read these, but you can uh, read them later. Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 42 tells us what disciples were to do. And then he tells us in two or three other places too. To be a disciple means a life of self-denial. And not my will be done, but God's will be done. And it means denying what you want to do and doing what God wants you to do. And so we need to pray as children of God and we need to ask Him, what do you want us to do? Forsaking all that we might see in front of us and turn and follow Jesus. Somebody said, it don't cost anything to go to church. I've told you that story about Ronnie and Linda Flynn that lived beside of us for several years and Mary and Donna go up there and get their animals and carry them down to our house and then they'd come down and get their toys and take them to their house. I'd say about an even swap, but not with the girls it wasn't. But I remember going to visit them and inviting them to church and they looked at one another and said, well, I don't know if we can go to church or not. And I said, why? It's right there. I mean, they live closer than we did. They're just catty-cornered across the road and there's the back of the church. And Ronnie looked at Linda and Linda looked at him and she said, well, I need to ask you a question. How much would it cost us to come to church? You know, that's a shame that people don't know. People think. And I've, I've heard people say, well, different things to different people. But the greatest price has already been paid to make it possible for you to come to church. And Jesus paid it. He paid the price for you to come. I don't know how many of you get the article from Castle Rock Church, but I just read it last night. And when I read it, they talked about how busy July is going to be. And one thing caught my attention where they were going to be out in parties that the town was giving and parties that different organizations were having and they were going to be there handing out information about their mission church. And then he said, one thing I believe we've got going for us this year is we are planning and we've got it typed out and we're going out full force to all these meetings that we're actually having Bible school for free. He said, now that might sound shocking to some of you, but we've looked and most churches here in Colorado are charging $30 to $40 per child for them to attend Bible school. Hmm. And he said, I think this is going to be one of the greatest eye-openers and door-openers that we could do is advertise free Bible school. So he said, you pray that this really works. He said, we're so excited about it. And I was excited when I could turn to Ronnie and Linda and said, listen, Jesus paid the price for you to go. I'm glad today 
that it didn't cost me when I stepped through the doors. But I gained everything. I lost nothing, but I gained everything. Listen to this. Count the cost of being a disciple. And then, number two, make a deliberate commitment of your life to Him. You know the country song, you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. Make a deliberate stand. Decide in your mind, in your heart, Romans 12 and 1 that I read to you. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Make that commitment. Make that sacrifice, he says. Come to that point of decision where you yield your bodies as a sacrifice to God. This is, he said, and I pointed it out to you, this is your only reasonable service because of what He did for us. He fought our battles. He won a war. And you and I have a place in heaven one day when He's got yours prepared, He'll call you there. And there'll be a great homecoming in the sky one day. And then number three, Abandon your life for Christ. Abandon your... And say, when you pray, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. I want God's will done more than anything else. And if we don't want God's will done, then we're going to do ours. And I guarantee you, his ways better than ours. He sees the beginning from the end. He knows what's best for us. And we need to pray, not our will be done, but your will be done. The Savior said this, whosoever will lose his life for my sake can find it, or will find it. Matthew 16, 25. In other words, if you want the full joy and happiness of your life, you should live it to please the Lord Jesus Christ and not please yourself. In Matthew 6.33, I can't help but think of that verse. Every time I hear somebody talk about doing the will of God, he says, put Jesus first and all these other things will be added to you. When you set your face like a flint, the Bible says, to do the will of God, wheresoever He leads me, I'll follow. And God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He'll make a way. And if we stay in His will, we don't have to worry about going back. I remember going into the office 3606 West End Avenue and talking to Dr. Pick and telling him how long I've been out of school and how big my family was and he said that's a big decision but we'll keep you one semester well at the end of the semester he said if the rest of it's up to you you can stay and so four and a half years later, I walked across the stage and I received my diploma and didn't owe one dime. And I know people still paying loans. I've said that to say this, it wasn't in our ability to do that, but it was in His. It wasn't something that we could just do but he could. I know a man who can. And then we have been following the Lord and doing our best. Has the road been smooth? No, it's been rough. Has it been all rosy? 
No, there's some potholes. Has it been all good? No, there have been some bad ones. I want to tell you, we're Christian soldiers here today. And there's not a battle that goes by that there's not some casualties. And there's not a battle that goes by that somebody's not wounded. And that happens to the best of us. But we can't be sidetracked to the point if you quit, who's going to take your place? We don't have old-fashioned preaching anymore. We have pep rallies. And we have encouraging sessions. But preaching the Word of God for people to make the will of God their will, that's not preached anymore. And number five, don't be sidetracked. I guess if there was anything that I had to battle or had come up so many times, it was a sidetrack. Now some of you here don't even know what a sidetrack is. But Regina sure does. She lived beside one. She was born beside one. Raiders Sidetrack is the name of the community she's from. And it's because for a couple of three miles, there's not one railroad right at her front door. There's two. One of them, you see a train pull over there and it just stops. And if you're on, you've got to go to the other side, you've got to wait for two trains. You've got to wait for the one coming, just like that one's doing. And then that one pulls out, then you can go. It's called sidetrack. There was a depot there. I didn't know until just a few years ago when I was down there visiting that the old depot's still there. And there's an arm on that depot, arm maybe two, three inches in diameter, it has a little hook on it, and that arm swings out toward the track. I didn't know what that was for until somebody told me. But they picked the mail up with it. The train didn't stop. It come and another hook grabbed the bag and pulled it into the train and there goes the mail. That was uh, Pony Express. You know, they, they call it horsepower. But that was steam engine power. I'm old enough to remember seeing the black smoke come out of those engines as they went down the track. I remember that. But if some people didn't get sidetracked, they'd make a better name for the Lord. Listen to me. So many start off well but then they lose their vision. They start off with their eyes on Jesus and doing something for Him and helping others, but then they look at somebody else when we get into the heat of the battle because Satan's there to do his best to stop you. And if you take your eyes off of Jesus, you'll get sidetracked in a heartbeat. You keep your eyes on Him. If you don't, you'll get back into the old routine. The Lord Jesus said, no man, I'm quoting Jesus, He said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's found in Luke chapter 9 verse 62. That means when God's called us and we're going down His road, His will, His way, 
This is the way to walk ye in it. You turn around and go back and you put your hand to the plow and you, that means going back to the old life. The old way. And not doing God's will. Jesus said it, I did. He said you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. That's His words. You read it, Luke 9, 23. Well, don't be sidetracked. It's Luke 9, 62. I'm sorry. And then the last one. Live to serve. Live to serve. To get the best out of your Christian life is do what Jesus said. Jesus said, I didn't come to minister or to be ministered to. I come to minister. You know what he's saying? I didn't come for you to serve me. I come to serve you. And remember at supper? He picked up a towel and girded himself and started washing the disciples' feet. He came as a servant. He humbled himself to be a servant. And he got to Simon Peter. And he said, Simon, I'm going to wash your feet. Peter said, You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said something to Peter that's hard to be understood. He said, if I don't wash your feet, Peter, you have no part with me. You remember that. Do you remember what Peter's reply was? Okay. Not only my feet, but wash my hands and my head also. That's what Peter said. Peter said, if You've got to wash my feet for me to have a part with you. I don't want you just to wash my feet. Just put me in all over. That's how we ought to be. Wade into the water. Wade in a little bit deeper. A little bit deeper. Matthew 20, 28 tells us the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. True greatness lies in what a man does for God while he's here in this world. It might be just handing a cup of cold water to somebody that can't get to it. We don't know what it is. But I'm convinced that God's got something for everybody to do. And you need to pray. There's some things that you need to do. You might say, Preacher, I think He wants you to do it. Show me that in the Bible. And I'll show you in the Bible where it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land and I'll bless them. You see, it takes all of us. Not just one. It takes all of us. But think about it on this 4th of July weekend. How to get the most out of your Christian life. Most people spend more time trying to think how in the world can I have the best time while I'm here? I want to tell you the best is yet to come. And we need to be thinking about that. We need to be thinking and laying up treasures over yonder. For thieves cannot break through. Rust cannot destroy. And where God will welcome us in when He gives us our reward. And I hope and pray that He'll say to everybody under the sound of my voice, and in Israel too, 
Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Listen, not easy, but God's got a job for us all to do. And let's do the best we can. Let's stand and we'll be this place. My wife did such a wonderful job with that song. I'm so proud of her. She got the talent. I'm going to ask her if she'll close out this service with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this service. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you care for us. We thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross to shed his blood that we may have the forgiveness of sin. And Lord, we pray and thank you for the word of God Church is dismissed tonight. See you Wednesday.